Jokar Zarnayev convicted of all 30 charges by a federal jury on Wednesday. The focus now turning to whether jurors, those same jurors, will agree to the death penalty or have him spend the rest of his life behind bars. Here now with reaction on the next steps, criminal defense attorney Whitney Bone and former prosecutor Troy Slayton. Welcome to both of you. Troy, a vast majority of Bostonians, according to a very recent poll, say Sarnayev should spend the rest of his life behind bars and not be put to death. It, it was really quite stunning, the numbers, 62 percent to 27 percent. What, if anything, does that tell us about what may happen next? Well, that tells us a lot about what the population as a whole in Massachusetts thinks. But these 12 jurors, during the voir dire process, were death penalty qualified, which means that they were able to convince the judge and the prosecutor that if push comes to shove, they'll be able to vote if the law provides for the death penalty in this case. Right. Uh, Whitney, what about that? It's true they were death penalty qualified, as it always has to be uh, in such yes. a case. They all said they're willing to sentence him to death, but there was one woman, one woman, Whitney, who said she's against the death penalty, but she could still consider imposing it. And all you need is one uh, to That's hang right. it up from death to life. That's correct. Um, in order for the U.S. government to obtain a death sentence for Zarnayev, there has to be a unanimous decision by the jury. You're correct. If one person decides, you know what, I don't think he deserves the death penalty. I think that the defense has presented competent and uh, good mitigating factors to a standard of a preponderance of the evidence or that more likely than not that they exist. Right. If one person decides that that outweighs any aggravating factor that the government can prove, then he's going to get life in prison instead of death. All right. Now let's talk about aggravating versus uh, mitigating. And Troy, let me start with you because, you know, you were on the prosecution side. Um, aggravating factors, um, what are they, for example? There are a breadth of aggravating factors in this case, Greg. The fact that they placed a bomb, and there's video of this that was played during the trial, behind the, the finish line, behind children. The fact that an eight-year-old was disemboweled and his uh, sister lost a leg. The fact that there was uh, an amazing amount of pre-planning and premeditation. The fact that they had talked about this being a, a, a holy war and them being essentially jihadis and wanting to uh, awaken the, the Mujahideen, which is the, the holy warriors in the United States. They looked at this as a war. There was the fact that they fled, which showed consciousness of guilt. There was a boatload of aggravating factors in All this right. case, Greg. So, Whitney, on the other side, the mitigating factors, and, and just so our viewers know, I mean, if the aggravating factors outweigh the mitigating factors, then you're talking about death. But it's a very subjective uh, weighing test. So uh, what are the mitigating factors? Well... First off, yeah, it doesn't come down to a numerical um, outnumbering necessarily, but right, like you said, subjective. it comes down to an outweighing. Yeah, it's 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 their decision if they think that you know even if there's only one mitigating factor, that that mitigating factor is more substantial and compelling than you know five aggravating factors. Right. And you know there are a lot of aggravating factors here, but as far as mitigating factors go, there's there's quite a few as well. I mean, you have to take into consideration that you know they're going to present evidence from probably very highly qualified and experienced defense experts relative to the fact that Zarnayev was 19 years old at the time that this crime was committed. Right. Which goes to the fact, you know, honestly, I, I bring this up all the time in my work as a defense attorney, his frontal lobe was not fully developed yet. Right. Um, you know, he's not thinking at the same level as somebody who is a fully developed adult. They're also going to hear mitigating factors that go to the fact that he had come here and had a very difficult time adjusting to life in the United States. He was he emotionally a distraught and disturbed. Which he was is emotionally literally, distraught. It's one of the mitigating factors here, 18 U.S. Code 3592. Are they, exactly. Whitney, are they going to say he was so intellectually underdeveloped and emotionally distraught that he was an easy, manipulated pawn by his older brother? 
Exactly. They're definitely going to say that the dynamic in his family, the dynamic of his moving here from a foreign country and having a difficult time adjusting, and the relationship between he and his brother, coupled with his level of um, you know, psychological functioning, psychiatric functioning, right. all coupled together contributed to his being able to be manipulated right. and being a lesser participant specifically to the commission of these crimes. All right. Now, Troy, um, here's a question for you. Uh, it's true that Tsarnaev chose not to take the witness stand on his own uh, behalf in the uh, guilt phase of the trial, but now we're in the penalty phase. And, you know, w one can argue the defense may feel like they have nothing else left to lose. Could they put Tsarnaev on the witness stand to try to portray him in some sympathetic light, especially given the extensive physical injuries he suffered in the shootout? You said, Greg, in the question that they've got nothing to lose. They've got a lot to lose. I think that his defense strategy from the very beginning was about the penalty phase. They were never arguing that whether he was guilty or not guilty of the crime. Right. This was a penalty phase from the very beginning. So directly to your point, yes, he could testify, but that exposes him to a very experienced prosecutor who will be allowed to then cross-examine him yeah. and talk about all the horrific things that he has been convicted of What do you bet committing? the defense and is going to make a, a motion in limine before the penalty phase begins to say, Your Honor, let's restrict any cross-examination if the defendant takes a witness stand, not to all the crimes, but rather to him and what he testifies to on direct. Well, there is a, a rule in court that you can only be subject to cross-examination on the topics that you testify to on direct. But, um, you know, the, you're given a lot of wide latitude. And once you get somebody up on the stand right. and they can accidentally open the door, and yeah. once that door is open, once they, they mention, uh, uh, touch on any subject, then it's fair game for cross-examination. Yeah, it's got to be a well, long Well, and the shot. rules of evidence, you know, the rules of evidence in the penalty phase are, are a lot more lax. I right. mean, they, they don't have to adhere to the same standards regarding hearsay, et cetera, in the federal evidence code that they right. would have had to in the guilt phase of the trial. So Whitney and Troy, it's really got a, risky. Got a le yeah, it's a big risk, and it's probably a long shot that he'll take the witness stand. Whitney Bone, Troy I Slayton, thank you both very much for your insights. And check out foxnews.com for more on the Zarnaev trial. I'm Greg Jarrett. Thanks for watching.